Um, Stay with Blair. I heard a recent interview with John Le Carre, who stated that after seeing Blair's performance at the Chilcot Inquiry on Iraq, he wouldn't want to interview or ask him anything. I take it he meant that Blair had covered covered all the angles, sealed off the monolith, and he was now impenetrable. If you had a chance, would you ask Blair a question? No, I wouldn't ask Goebbels a question either. Not that he's the same, but it's the same principle. Yeah, I mean, their business is to you know, protect themselves, to you know, produce answers which don't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't even think there's much point talking to the uh, uh, journalists and intellectual support of the war. I mean, you can always make an excuse for anything. Yeah. You know, but who, who, what, do you, what information are you going to get from them? Moving on to Palestine, I asked you a question in a past email regarding the ongoing Israeli atrocities, atrocities towards the Palestinians and the fact that Israel always resort to their tiresome line of defense regarding Hamas and their aims being the destruction of Israel. I wondered why Hamas wouldn't just shout their rejection of violence and their willingness to go along with whatever the Palestinian people want from the rooftops. You stated that you agreed that they, Hamas, should shout it from the rooftops, though it wouldn't be listened to. I'm not sure about this, though. Wouldn't it be the case that if Hamas were absolutely unequivocal about their commitment to non-violent resistance, the Israeli and the compliant elements of the world's media would not be able to offer any justification for their violent actions? Hamas could, in effect, no. call Israelis I bluff. Think, I think it would have zero effect. Uh, and there's no particular reason why they should humiliate themselves. I mean, if, if you want to play the game of uh, uh, commitment to district, uh, commitment with, I mean, Hamas has already for years join come out in favor of the international consensus on a two-state settlement. They, they say they don't want to recognize Israel. I mean, does the Democratic Party recognize Pakistan? The political parties don't recognize countries. Uh, if they're part of a government that recognizes Israel, okay, that's uh, all that matters. Couldn't they just say we recognize Israel? It doesn't Why mean should anything they? in concrete. I, mean, they, I don't think they should. Should the Democratic Party recognize uh, England? No. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, why? This is simply a means of trying to humiliate them and prevent uh, diplomacy. These are ridiculous demands. For, furthermore, if we want to pursue this line of reasoning, well, let's take uh, the ruling party in Israel, Likud party. Uh, they, they have a program. I mean, their official program, program on which they won the election, is that there cannot be any Palestinian self-determination anywhere in the land of Israel. Well, what's the land of Israel? Maybe they meant the Jordan to the sea, but if you go back to the Likud Charter, which they never withdrawn, that includes Jordan. So they're committed to the destruction of all Palestinians. And further, it's not just a verbal commitment, they're carrying it out. And they have the goal to say Hamas is committed to our destruction. I mean, you can't even laugh, you know. Uh, uh, and I, you know, I, a lot I don't like about Hamas, but to ask them to accept these terms is just an effort at sheer humiliation. Yeah. Why should they accept it? I mean, you could say the same about other countries. I suppose that the United States insisted that Mexico uh, uh, recognize the right of the United States to exist sitting on half of Mexico conquered in a war. Why should they? They'll never do that. They recognize the United States, but not its right to exist sitting on half of Mexico. Uh, suppose that uh, Iran was powerful enough so that it could demand that we recognize Iran as an Islamic state. Should we do it? No, why should we? And why should anyone recognize Israel as a Jewish state? I mean, there's no reason to set up these standards. These are just... Uh, it's various nice. techniques that have been designed to try to evade diplomacy. You mentioned in a recent interview that Reagan's deification is in marked contrast to public opinion during his, during his lifetime and diametrically opposed to his actual achievements whilst in office. You stated that having gods to worship is the easiest way to distract people. Why Reagan though and Kennedy? Why not Carter or LBJ? Is it because they most easily fit brand America? Well, uh, Kennedy is deified mostly among kind of liberal intellect, you know, sort of educated sector. Uh, and he was, he, he knew what he was doing. 
uh, he realized that if he sort of buttered up the intellectuals, he'd get a good press. And if you look at the whole creation of the Camelot image, that's just what happened. I mean, it was right here in Boston, it was dramatic. Uh, there was a shuttle, a plane that went from, Eastern shuttle went from Boston to Washington every day and back. In the morning, the Harvard and MIT professors would get on the shuttle to go down to Washington, you know, have lunch with Jackie, uh, you know, and talk to the great man, and come back in the evening and tell us you know, how marvelous Camelot is. I'm going to exaggerate a little, but that, God, no. but that was the, that, that's kind of what was going on. And it ended up with uh, Kennedy having a very good picture of the administration. The crimes uh, uh, just suppressed. That was, he, was, he was a very dangerous man. I mean, thought could go through it, but uh, his administration brought us pretty close to nuclear war, uh, needlessly, a lot, apart from a lot of other things. Uh, but it's, yeah, maybe scholars know about it, but it's not the image. Well, what about Reagan? Well, you know, Reagan, uh, he was not particularly popular. Uh, there are polls in the United States. You can check them. They have been studied. In fact, when he left office, say around 1990, he was, uh, polls show that he was actually the most unpopular living president, apart from Nixon. He was below Carter and so on. But then a uh, huge campaign developed called the Reagan Legacy to try to turn him into a kind of Kim Il-sung figure. So if you read publications from, say, the Hoover Institute at Stanford University, uh, he's described as uh, a colossal figure, uh, a f a f hovers over us like a friendly ghost. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of thing you might get out of North Korea. But now here you get it out of the Hoover Institute at uh, Stanford, and uh, uh, there's been a, 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 he's presented as the uh, model of a free enterprise, you know, limited government, and so on. Actually, he, he tripled the deficit. Uh, he uh, the government grew under his uh, regime. He was the most protectionist president in post-war American history. He doubled the uh, uh, import restrictions to try to salvage. Uh, uh, incompetent American management, which couldn't compete with the Japanese. And in the international sphere, it's just a mass murder. I mean, in Central America, his, he had a war on terror. It, it, it killed a couple hundred thousand people. It's, it's being suppressed, like in this morning's newspaper. If you read the New York Times, you notice a little item about the uh, arrest of 20 Salvadoran uh, soldiers for the murder of uh, six the Jesuit intellectuals in 1989. You know, it happened to be slightly after Reagan left, but those are the policies that the Reagan administration was initiating. The killers, they didn't say it in the paper, but the killers had just, they came from a battalion, the Atlacatl Battalion, which had already killed tens of thousands of people. It was one of the most brutal, vicious battalions, armed and trained by the Reagan administration. Uh, they had just come from uh, upgrading their training at the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare School in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, so it ties it together nicely, came back to El Salvador, uh, given orders by the high command, which was in close contact with the U.S., to break into the university and assassinate the Jesuit intellectuals. Now, this is a week after the fall of the Berlin Wall. It not only destroyed essentially wiped out liberation theology, which was a, a great fear for the U.S. back from the early 1960s when it began. Uh, they were adopting the preferential option for the poor. You know, they were trying to go back to the Gospels. The U.S. fought a major war against the church. Uh, this was the last, plenty of religious martyrs. Uh, this was the last, pretty much the last step. Uh, that's of enormous historic importance. It's out of history, uh, and that's just a piece of Reagan's legacy. I mean, Reagan was one of the strongest supporters of apartheid. Uh, the, uh, he, in, in order to increase support for the apartheid regime, uh, Reagan not only had, had to even violate congressional sanctions, which he did, and there was a justification, war on terror. Uh, 1988, uh, the White House condemned the African National Congress as the words were one of the more notorious terrorist groups in the world. In fact, Mandela himself 
just got off the terrorist list about two years ago. So he can now come to the United States without a special visa. So in order to fight the war on terror, they have to support apartheid. And not only did that support crimes inside South Africa, but it also supported South African rampaging in the neighboring countries, uh, which according to a later UN analysis led to a million and a half deaths uh, in um, the Middle East. Strongly supported the Reagan, supported the uh, Israeli invasion of uh, Lebanon and of course participated in it. Uh, vetoed Security Council resolutions and so on, the usual, and in fact continued to support it until it became it was becoming harmful to American interests by mid-August. So he ordered Begin to call it off. What year was that? Hmm? What year was it? 1982, August 82, and of course Israel obeyed. They have to. Uh, so he, you know, gave him the go-ahead, called it off when it was done. Another 20,000 people, his record. Uh, it goes on and on. And this guy's a you know, serious mass murderer, and certainly you know, to call him an image of free trade, and actually the deficit, the, up until Reagan, the United States had been a creditor country, the world's leading creditor. The Reagan very quickly turned it into the world's leading debtor. Uh, that's fiscal responsibility, <laughs> and, and also tripled the national debt. But you, know, you concoct imagery, you do anything you like, that's what public relations is about.